her and it's as usual put thoughts into our mind to set our goal, stay in our purpose. The more clearly we all know in our life, the more clearly we stay in our purpose, the more likely we are to get that result. So the purpose here, we think, is to listen to these teachings to see if there's something useful. We can use these tools in our lives to help us to finally develop our immense potential. Why? So we do it better Think about the way it's happening. If I don't do it, who do it? As Amazon says, I myself alone. It's courage of the body suffering. Sangi chadam soke chadam la jan chuba luda gi kyap suchi Dagi chan yen gi personam ki Jola peche sangi dropa Sangi chadam soke chadam la jan chuba luda gi kyap suchi Dagi chan yen gi personam ki Jola peche sangi dropa Sangi chadam soke chadam la jan chuba luda gi kyap suchi Dagi chun yen gi pe sonam ki Drola pe chi sangi rupa shu So I'm really confused about today's title, I have to say. So if you've got any clues, what you want me to talk about? <laughs> I saw the word enthusiasm. That sounds good. We can talk about that. Does anybody have any ideas what it meant? What you expected from the title? Or you don't care? <laughs> what I talk about? Huh? <laughs> 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 well, I mean, the word, okay, I looked at it and I thought, well, okay. Um, it sounded like, if you, it sounded like when you don't want to do something, how do you get yourself to be enthusiastic to do it? And that's, that sounds useful. That sounds extremely useful to talk about. Because what that's about is uh, having a version for something that you're supposed to do and then how to turn your mind around to want to do it. Instead of building up all this misery which we tend to do, we do things resentfully and in the end we all have mental breakdowns because of it, you know? So, and then if we look at, if we understand, give some context to it, um, this enthusiasm, a joyful, joyful effort as it's called, enthusiastic perseverance, which is the fourth of the six perfections of the Bodhisattva, which is taught at the Mahayana level, and it's, uh, and it sounds kind of abstract to us really, enthusiasm, joyful effort, it sounds very peculiar really, we can't quite imagine what it is or even how you get it, because it's not necessarily a, 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 you know, a way we think in our lives, is it, or we like how to develop joyful effort. And why it's even there, and you know, the fourth of these six. They say of the first, the first four of these perfections in the Bodhisattva path, uh, they're taught in order of difficulty, and this is the most difficult, and therefore the most important. Also, they say without this one, you can't, you can't accomplish your goal. You know, so these first four are the accomplishment of the wis of the compassion wing, if you like, if you use the idea of the two wings of the bird, and then the last two are the are the cultivation of the wisdom wing, the realization of emptiness, of course. So let's look at the context, kind of, you know, this one, this enthusiasm one, and what it's about. Well, to un when we understand the opposite of it, then we put it into really clear focus, I think. And the opposite, oddly enough, we would never, it, it's not obvious to us the way we think, is they call it, they call it laziness, which sounds very peculiar. So let's look at that, because this is, this is well, once we understand it, in the way that the lovers talk about it, it really does make sense to us. And then we can see how the opposite is enthusiasm, and then we can see how we desperately need this enthusiasm to achieve our goal. So laziness, they talk about it at three levels. The first one is the obvious one, the one that we all, we all understand, the way we tend to use the word. It's sort of like, can't be bothered. It can't be bothered. So obviously, when you think, so obviously here, the context is spiritual practice. 
the accomplishment of Buddhahood. But even if we think of this in ordinary life, which technically means it's not a spiritual, it's not a virtue, it's just samsara, but we can understand it in general, you know. When we think of, um, you got, usually you say you can't be bothered about something you don't want to do, isn't it? Which means something you have aversion for. And we, we all know the thing we want, we are bothered to do, we get excited about doing, is something we have attachment for. Of course, this is, this is using the Buddhist psychological view and it's a really fundamental one and very easy to help us understand our minds. Because the, the fundamental one that drives us from moment to moment, as we've been talking you know, all the time, and as Buddha talks all the time, is this attachment. Attachment. Attachment, most broadly, to what I want. So we will put immense effort into things that we are attached to doing. But we will avoid doing things you know, that we're not attached to doing, which means the things we have aversion for. So in terms of spiritual practice, of course, it takes enormous... You've got to really got, got to want to do it. Because, the suit, okay, when we understand that lazy can't be bothered, the thing you don't want to do is also... Because why? It's because it's too much effort. You can't be bothered. It's too much effort. So on a winter night, and I'm just talking ordinary again, Samsara here, on a winter's night, you're all cosy at home, you've got a nice cosy home, and someone wants to go... You want to go out, you know? And you don't particularly attract it. You're not especially attached to that person. It's not the love of your life. So, and then you, just, you, you look at the coziness. You feel your comfort. You're settled in. You're warm. You're cosy. You're in your chair. The telly's on. You've just had your dinner. You, you, who, who would want to get up out into that cold and go out with that boring person? Can't be bothered, we'd say. That's what laziness is. So, um, obviously we're talking about our spiritual practice here. But the other one thing we, we say we can't be bothered about, which we have aversion to do, which is the thing that takes too much effort, because you don't, you're not good at it. So when, to learn something new, there's another way of looking at it. When you, want, when you need to learn something new, of course it takes enormous effort because you're not used to it yet, you're not familiar with it. You've got to make, literally make an effort. So it's not surprising they call this, they call this characteristic joyful effort. You know? We want to have joyful effort. Make effort with a happy mind. So, the, w the way the lamas always say, and it sounds very <coughs> logical, the only time you'll ever make effort to do anything is when you know the benefits of it. When you know the benefits. So you mightn't even be attached to doing it, and it might be difficult, that, that activity. But because you know the results that will come, you will make effort. And so when it comes to our spiritual practice, there's no question. You've got to tell yourself the benefits because it's not evident to us. We're stuck in our comfort zone here. We can't see any evidence of our getting any better. We know theoretically to be nice to be compassionate and nice to be wise and nice to give up attachment, but it doesn't compel us. We're so caught up in our attachment, the attachment to our comfort zone, which is really the attachment that's, 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 that's insulted right here. The very first level of laziness can't be bothered. is because you're attached to your comfort zone. We're attached to this sort of being settled. And this is a very deep inertia in all of us. We can see, you know. So even when it comes to worldly pursuits, look how hard it is to make effort. You want to go to the gym. You want to get fit. You promise yourself you get fit. Even though you really can see the benefits of having less weight on your body and more toned muscles, feeling better, you can see the benefit. You want it every day. But look at the effort you have to make because, you're not, because you've got to force yourself to do it. And in general, as we understand, anything you have to accomplish, if you can't do it now, it means you've got to force yourself. You've got to push. And that's what effort means, isn't it? That's what effort means. So we look at this inertia of comfort, this attachment to our comfort zone. It's mental, physical. It's so ingrained. And so, of course, it's enormously hard to go against. And this is the first level of laziness. And keep just looking at your ordinary samsaric examples and we can see it clearly. Forget your spiritual practice. So hard to get past that. But we know in our ordinary life there is nothing we will accomplish. Nothing. If we don't make effort. Because you have to make effort to get used to something. It's just the way it is. So this is the, the deepest problem. The, the, most, the most gross level of laziness. Now the second one is interesting that they should call it laziness. But you, you hear it. We hear the logic of it. And that's called, oh, I'm busy, I'll do it later. 
That's called procrastination. So obviously, what's the thing you will put off doing? It's obvious. The thing that takes too much effort. And this one, this is where we now lie to ourselves. We cheat ourselves here. We really believe our own propaganda. We really believe we're too busy. And, you know, it all happens so quick in the mind, like in a millisecond. You think of that thing you should do, and again, I'm even just talking ordinary samsara. You think of that thing you're supposed to do, you should do, you know you should do, you've got to get it done. But in, within a millisecond, the thought of it arises, you're attached to the, to the comfort zone, the inertia of where you are now, you don't want to make that effort, it's a big drag, you can't be bothered, but you lie to yourself and say, oh, I'm too busy, I'll do it later. And it all happens about a second. You can't even catch the story. We haven't got to the third one yet, there's a third level, the worst, the most primordial, the one that really prevents us. Forget even that one yet, but just this one. We can see, you know. I mean, I look at my life, and I, aren't I lucky that I, you know, as I'm trying to be a Buddhist, so most of the content of my work is so-called Buddhist. You know, I edit books, Buddhist books. I have to speak Buddhist words. I've got to do Buddhist practice, you know. It's all so-called Buddhist. But even within all that, I'm fortunate, I still, the certain jobs I like to do and certain jobs I don't. Certain jobs I put off doing. I see my mind. It's unbelievable, you know, how this is one of our deepest problems. And it's all based on attachment. All based on attachment. Attachment to being comfortable. Attachment to how I feel now. Attachment to not being disturbed. Attachment to comfort, basically. Attachment to comfort. And it actually, it, and this is in a way what we're going to say now, is like this fear of having to do it. Because the third one, the most primordial, which is curious to call it laziness, but we can understand the logic when we talk about it like this, is the thought... Nah, not possible. I can't do that. Not possible. I can't achieve that. Now forget even in our spiritual practice, but if we look at our ordinary life, this is one of the major obstacles. We're, we're fearful. We don't think we don't have much confidence. We're comfortable. We're scared of what people think. There's a whole multitude of things, you know, that all of it conspiring to keep us in our comfort zone, to keep us where we are, to keep us stuck not moving very far. You know, it's a bit like, I mean, it's so fundamental and so obvious that it's not possible to achieve anything, to learn something new, put it this way, without making effort. Because we're, we're not familiar with it yet. We haven't familiarized our mind and our body with doing it. So we all know, you've, in order to accomplish anything, to learn a little bit of music, to learn a new language, to do a, a learn a new job, to clean your room, you've got to make effort. And this, the most gross can't be bothered. And then I'm busy. I'm too busy. We run around doing all the things that we, you know, we are familiar with doing, which therefore they're easy to do. And therefore it's again suiting our attachment. So to get out of our comfort zone is very painful. It's very scary for us, you know. And we can and we lie to ourselves terribly. But it's a bit like it's a bit like, you know, you've got to do, you've, got to, you've, you've made a commitment to do your push-ups every day because you want to get fit. And you do your push-ups. But the moment it gets difficult, you stop. And then you say, oh, I did my push-ups. Well, actually, you didn't. <coughs> you didn't achieve a single thing. Because you, you know the nature of a thing like physical exercise. You've got a certain goal. You've got to keep moving. And that means you've got to go past the point where it hurts. Well, you've got to get to the point where it hurts and then even go one push up more, because then you'll start to make a change in your body. If you only do it to your level of your comfort, you can pretend that you've done your push ups, but you haven't. Nothing will change in your body, it'll stay the same. Same mentally. If you stay where you are, you know this much music, and you do a little bit of fiddling on the piano, oh, I did my practice today, but you don't get any further. You don't progress because you didn't make effort. You didn't go past your comfort zone, and your comfort zone is your attachment, attachment to the comfort zone attachment to where we are now because it's we're scared to push we don't like pushing it's fearful it's not comfortable it's not pleasant this is why we mostly don't succeed at what we're trying to do we stay in our comfort zone you know and we know how we would we admire people who achieve things you know achieve their goals spiritual i mean we're talking spiritual here we're meant to be 
And then we, th we think of, say, we might have a friend who's in retreat. I can think of one of the monks, our, our monks who's been doing serious retreat for years and years and years, you know. And, it, and, 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 and it, when you think of something like that, you think, oh, that you sort of, you put it out up there somewhere. Oh, that's not possible. And that's where the not possible comes in. No, that's not possible. I couldn't do that. That's impossible. We see a big distance between us and the goal. And that, again, look at ordinary daily life. You want to get fit. You want to have nice toned muscles and a bit less fat on your body, even just that. But you've been stuck in this habit for a long time. And then you see a person who's all really fit and has done it and all excited and enthusiastic. And then there's a, but you, you, you know, what it should do is inspire us. Because if we, if we know that if they can do it, I can do it. But we see this distance between us and them. We think, no, that's not possible. I couldn't do that. And that's the worst one. That's the one that stops us, prevent, that prevents us from achieving anything. Because the fact is, speaking spiritually, it is utterly illogical to say you can't do it. It is true you can't do it today and get there in a day. You can't suddenly overnight become an enlightened being or get single point of concentration. Of course not. But it's just not true to say I can't do it. But because it looks so perfect out there, way above me, then it seems like, oh, that, that looks unattainable. And that's the worst, like I said, the worst one. That keeps us stuck completely in the comfort zone. You know? we, won't, we, won't, we won't try, we won't make an effort. But if we understand cause and effect, understand karma, understand how learning anything is incremental, and if you do a little bit every day, but you go past your comfort zone, even by one push-up, eventually you will progress. But if you don't get past that point, you will never progress. I think we understand this, you know. You've got to, in other words, you've got to have courage, enthusiasm, enthusiastic perseverance, they call it, or joyful effort. We hear it, you know, we can really hear it. And this is the key to success. You can have, you know, all the other qualities. You can have masses of wisdom. You can, have, you can be immensely patient. You can be kind. You can have wisdom. You can understand emptiness. You can be loving. But if you haven't got enthusiasm, this joyful effort, the fourth of these first four of the six perfections, they will say, you, can't, you will not succeed. Because it's this one that is the, the energy that gets you to achieve your goal. I think it's something so pervasive, you know. I mean, in general, um, I can think of myself, and I, you know, in, in, one, in one sense, I don't, I don't seem, because I'm always busy and rushing about, looking like I'm so busy, looking like I'm not a lazy person, but I can see this tendency so strong, this inertia, to not want to do the things that are too difficult. You put it off, answering certain emails, or doing certain jobs, or feeling, even just the bits and pieces in your day and your life. You know, again, looking ordinary, even our samsaric world putting off cleaning the room, putting off doing the filing, putting off doing that thing, putting off fixing that old stuff. And we, over our life, we build up all this stuff that's behind, kind of, you know, at us, we're feeling guilty about it, but we keep putting off doing it. That's why we don't succeed. That's why we don't succeed. It's very simple. Mm -hmm. That's why someone like His Holiness the Dalai Lama or Ramazan Rinpoche look like they achieve a million times more because they don't put anything off. This is mir it's miraculous. But we can see this deeply inside us. And it's because of attachment. Attachment to where we are. Attachment to what feels comfortable. You know? Because we're very fearful. And this is why the third one, I can't do it. This can even be, you can even, you know, again, the context here is spiritual. But we can see this tendency in our own lives. You've got your life, you've got your house, you've got your job, you've got this, you've got that. You're settled, you know, you're settled. And then someone comes along and says, oh, look, come to Paris for the weekend. I mean, it might be stupid, or it might not be, but the first thing we'll say is, oh, don't be ridiculous, it's not possible. Of course not. You don't, even, you don't even think of the possibility of doing it. We don't like to get outside the box. And that's, that's what this I can't do it is about, the worst laziness. The worst one. Not possible. Oh, I can't do that. Not possible. I've got to do this and this and this and this and this. Not possible, we'll say. We say this most of the time about most things. Because the second we get outside our comfort zone, we know it's really scary. 
because, and that's because of attachment. When we understand this using Buddhist psychology, it's really clear to us. We, we, are comfort we want to be comfortable. We want to be unthreatened. We want things to be all nice. As soon as it's uncomfortable, as soon as it's outside our comfort zone, which is what, and this is the point, that's what aversion, that's what aversion means. Aversion means, you know, when we understand attachment and aversion, these fundamental states of mind, in Buddhist psychology, which seems so simple to us. We don't use these words in our serious psychology talks in the West. We talk about A, B, I, B, and bipolar this, and blah, blah, that, and like, you know, talk about mental, I mean, personality disorders, all these serious words. Excuse me, Buddhist psychology has been working very nicely for two and a half thousand years. If people get enlightened using it, I should think it's quite, you know, an advanced system. So don't insult Buddhist, you know, don't underestimate simple talk like attachment and aversion. It's driving us all the time. The more we apply the Buddhist understanding, it's, you know, it's very hidden to us. We can't see it this way. Attachment is a, the motor that propels us from second to second to second. But fundament, basically, this bottomless pit of craving <coughs> to get what I want. And that, in one obvious way, that means get nice feelings, get nice things, pleasant, unthreatened, comfortable, reasonable, orderly, everything nice. We can't, the second attachment is in, you know, offended, and that certainly would be true if you have to go out on a cold night or do your push-ups until you sweat. Things like this. It's the deep, deep, deep attachment just to this body, to the, the comfort of the body. Even. And then not to mention, of course, mentally. So attachment aversion, they're just there all the time, all the time. This craving to make things nice, to be, be comfortable, calm, peaceful, pleasant. Which is fine to want that, but you know, to learn anything, you've got to you've got to threaten that. Just to go learn a new language, you've got to upset the apple cart completely. You've got to force your mind to think new thoughts. You've got to go extra effort to make it happen. You've got to think about it. You've got to study. It's not comfortable. And that's why if we don't, that's why with the spiritual practice that we don't really have logical reasons why we're doing it. So we don't know the benefits of it, as the lovers say. We won't. It won't. We won't. It won't sustain. We'll give it up, or we'll sink into a very minimal level of just sort of pretending, you know, like do a push up until it hurts. We've got to know the benefits. I always use this example, which is, and it's just a worldly example, but to me it's a really good example of this enthusiasm. Again, it's a worldly one. I always remember in, when I was living in California, reading one of the papers is about these young guys, young guys who had a, who had a startup, an IT startup company, and they were they were they decided to you know to have an IPO, put you know on the stock exchange, the initial public offering. And so, of course, they had to work immensely hard to get ready for this, and that meant millions of dollars for them. So, the, you know, the, the goal of anybody starting a business, you can't imagine the possibility of you're actually going to get rich. It sounds fantastic, you know. And then, so, I think they said something like, I remember they said something like that they worked 18 hours a day, seven days a week for six months. I don't remember the details. Now, if you think of that, absolutely without doubt, they woke up in the morning exhausted, there's a guarantee they would rather have gone right back to sleep. Can't be bothered. Then they remembered their goal, and they got out of bed. And then for sure, they would rather have put it off. Go out with a girlfriend instead. Go to the football. They remembered their goal, and they did it. And there's no doubt they would have had agonies of doubt. Oh my God, is this really possible? Can we really achieve it? You know, like the doubts that you can't do and you really, is it possible? Can we really achieve this? I bet they had massive doubts, but they kept going and they achieved their goal. That's enthusiasm. That's joyful effort against those three levels. And that's how you achieve the goal. You won't achieve it otherwise, you know. And that's just a worldly example. Well, we can see it, we recognize it in ourselves only very deeply. Putting things off and can't, can't do it. But the putting things off is one of the worst because we're all so busy in our lives. We have so many activities. 
so many responsibilities. I mean, no wonder we're all, you know, having neurotic, no wonder we're not having mental breakdowns. There's so much we are met, we are supposed to do, you know, to keep the whole ball rolling. But there's so much we keep putting off because we, we have aversion to it, because we can't be bothered. It's too much effort because we're not because we don't have attachment for it, basically, speaking in worldly terms. I see it in, like I said, I see it in my work. I run to certain activities. I prefer certain activities. I run to those. So then we lie to ourselves by saying we're too busy. We're not too busy. We lie to ourselves. We should be much more honest. So, you know, in terms of the spiritual practice, we start our spiritual practice and we, you know, we, we um, schedule it for the morning. Best is, of course, before you do anything else. But within a few days, you know, you wake up. And within, like I said, within a second it happens in your mind and you don't even notice it because the thoughts go so quickly. Oh, too much, too, too, I can't be bothered. Oh, then I'm really busy. Then within a second, it's, oh, no, I'm too busy. I'll do it later. And then you feel better. You feel like you, you've assuaged you your guilt. <coughs> but you've lied to yourself. We should say, be more honest, I can't be bothered. And I prefer to prioritise getting up, having breakfast, having my coffee, having a shower, washing myself, getting in my clothes and going to work. I mean, you don't go, you don't do your practice and then go, oh, I can't have any breakfast, I'm too busy, I'll do that later. Or you don't sort of stay in your pyjamas, I'm too busy to get changed, but you do your practice instead. And oh, I'll, 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 you know, I'll go to work in my pajamas because I'm too busy to change. I don't think so. We do what we're attached to doing, and that, of course, includes attachment to what people think of us. We would never go to work in our pajamas and be embarrassed because we're attached to reputation. So we shouldn't lie to ourselves. At least it's a good start. Say, okay, notice that you can't be bothered. Notice you're putting it off. And this happens so quickly. I see my own mind. I'm mortified. Within a, I mean. Fraction of a second. I see the different jobs I've got to do, and I see that one I've got to do, and I, already I'm seeing myself. Don't want, you know, and I go to the other one. And then you, you've covered it, you forgot. You've covered up a lie, you know, in your mind. Can't be, you know, too much effort. But I'm procrastinating. I'm too busy. Do it later. But the one that can't do it, that's certainly in practice, you know. You think of like achieving single point of concentration. And what we do is we imagine having single point of concentration. And we see where we are now, and we just see this, imp there's no, we can't see the space between there and me, that and me where I am now. It just seems impossible. I can't do that. Not possible. But I see this a lot, in, like again, and we use our ordinary examples. I always remember going to one centre somewhere, little centre, tiny centre. Very sweet, sweet man who ran it, you know. And and uh, they 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 asked me to uh, kind of you know have a bit of a meeting with all the all the volunteers and see what we could come up with some new plans for the centre. And what I was, what I've learned from myself running the Liberation Prison Project, <coughs> it's very you know it's there are really practical methods you can use in ordinary life to help you set a goal and then see if in the aim to achieve it, which is the, which is the third one of I can do it, it is possible, that one. It just seems unattainable, you know. So when you think of a, like even running a business or even starting a business, or in this case it was a Buddhist centre. This little centre was sort of stuck in being this little centre. And so, I mean, we all sat down, all the people, and, I've, and I learned from my own experience with the prison project, it's a very helpful, you do it in terms of what you can, you do it in terms of a budget. You have expenses and income. So we have two headings, expenses and income. And in the expenses one, you write, and it's a, it's a good way to, lay, to put out some plans, some goals. Okay, what's our goal? What would you like to have? You know, what would you like? And then you put the cost of it. And then you can do the, the you know, work out if, you, if it's possible to achieve it. But it puts it down in writing. It was, I found this very helpful. So we did this, and then I said to the director, okay, let's start. I said, would you, would you like a, a beautiful statue for your altar? <coughs> And he said, no, 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 it's not possible. I haven't, got the, I haven't got the money for that. And I said, I didn't ask you that. Would you like a beautiful new statue? And he said, kept saying, no, no, we, don't, we can't afford it. Not on a salary. We can't afford it. We don't have any money. I said, I didn't ask you that. Would you like a beautiful new statue for the altar? And he kind of like, oh, uh, yes. Are you understanding what I'm saying here? 
He was, he, and this is our biggest problem. We're even too scared to even think the thought. And that's the worst stumbling block. And what I realized from doing the prison project and from this type of process was it does not cost one cent to think something. And when we understand karma, which is, as Lama Zopa says, he puts it, everything exists on the tip of the wish. You've got to state the thought first. You've got to state the thought first. Yes, I want a beautiful new statue for our Gompa. But this is the thing. He was this wonderful, kind, humble person. But he was never even able to have the thought, I would like a beautiful new statue. Because the first thing you think of, oh, we can't do it. We haven't got the money. And then where do you go with that? Zero. It stays exactly there. Are you hearing me, people? So in the end, then you start to hear it, then people start to get excited. And then really then people start to really enjoy. So we did an entire plan for one year. An ideal, an ideal statue, this, six classes, six, six courses a year, six visiting teachers, the airfares, and this, how much every single penny down. And you could see people's kind of really enjoying this idea. The per almost like the permission to say you're allowed to have something. Very fascinating, I swear to you. And then we did all the income. And we ended up with a surplus. A reasonable idea of where you think the money would come from. And I remember he was, and everybody was completely amazed at this process. But we're even too scared to go there, you know? So the idea is if someone says, come from Paris for the weekend, instead of, and I'm again only talking worldly things here, but it's a great example, instead of immediately saying, oh no, no, that's not possible, you say, what a good idea. Let's look at it. And you never know. You might suddenly realise it's only going to cost that much. I can only have two days. I'll put off this and the kids can go there and I've got enough on my credit card. What a nice idea. I'll come with you. But we never do this because we're too scared. Oh, it's not possible. That's, in ordinary terms, when we understand this one, that's the third laziness, the worst one. Because it keeps you completely stuck. We don't even think it's possible. So the thing I really learned from this is it's, you've got to have the thought first. You've got to have the thought, and it costs zero to have a thought. And you just never know. So, of course, we're talking here our spiritual attainments. To think it's possible. Uh, even then to state. And when we understand karma, that every thought we have does sow a seed, then we'll understand the character of a lot of our prayers, which are these aspirations. And don't just think that's wishful thinking. It's actually sowing the seed. I want to become a Buddha. So at least, you know, it's what's interesting. We're, we're able to say our prayers. Oh, I want to become a Buddha and say more sentient beings. But we can't say, oh, I want to go to Paris. I mean, if we understood what we're saying by saying, I want to become a Buddha, it would blow your mind. But we say it because it's religion. We don't think it's serious, you know. But going to Paris somehow seems real. But becoming a Buddha seems like in the sky somewhere. So we say it. Not realising it's deadly serious, you know. So we've got to state the goal. Speak the words. Then you check if it's possible. And then you do it. If you never think I will do it, if you never think I want it, you will never try to do it. And this is why I think we're so good at this in the West when it comes to plans for starting businesses and things. You know, you do your budget, you do your plan, you do your proposal, you do your this, you do your mission statement, you have the whole thing mapped out. We're geniuses at it. We know how to do it. Well, and that's what the, the you know the map of the Buddhist path is. You've got your map. You know where you're heading, and you aspire towards it every day. And you take each step as you go. That should give us immense confidence. But we often just think the prayers are meaningless. Oh, you're just saying, oh, may I become Buddha, may I become sentient beings. Oh, yeah, Bodhicitta. Oh, yeah, may I become Buddha, may I sentient beings. We say it. We say it every day. But we think it's kind of nothing. Don't underestimate. It's inc even if you do this much, I tell you, it's incredible. Because you're sowing the seeds. Every thought is... The word karma, remember, the word karma means the word intention. And it refers to the law of cause and effect, which is that every thought sows a seed that then will leave, program your mind that will ripen in the future as your future experiences. So we understand that We'll be delighted to say these thoughts. Yes, I want to become a Buddha. And, and that is already in self-practice. You're sowing the seeds. Just that alone is incredible.
So to actually cultivate enthusiasm, wow, way to go. But, you know, we have to be methodical about it. Because we know ourselves, if you, begin, if you begin playing music, you know, you begin, you know, you learn to do anything. You learn to drive the car, you learn the new language, you learn to go on, you, you're starting, starting the new language, starting to drive the car, starting to do the diet. In the beginning, you're all excited, and then it's just drudgery, isn't it? And you don't see any better, but you even think you're getting worse. And that's a critical time. Because there's no pleasure at all. It's just hard, painful work. You're stretching yourself to the limit. But at some point, we all know, if we do persevere, you begin to get a feeling for it. You begin to get a taste for it. And that's when the pleasure comes. That's when genuine enthusiasm comes. When you really can see there was some benefit to doing it. You're getting some result, you know. With spiritual practice, of course, it takes time. Because indeed, we do feel like we're getting worse first. In fact, when they teach about the, the, the process of developing single point of concentration, which is described in terms of nine stages, they talk about one of the signs of, of stage one <coughs> is you think you're getting worse, but you're not. You're just seeing your junky mind. It always feels like it's getting worse before it gets better. And this, like I said, that's the critical time to, to really persevere, to understand that it is a sign of success. You come home from that gym, you've got pains in muscles you didn't know you had. You've got to recognise that that's good pain. Not say, oh my God, I get pain if I go to the gym, I better not do that, and you won't succeed. So it feels like it's getting worse. But eventually, when you're on a roll, get a bit on a roll, you know. But spiritual practice, of course, it takes a lot, a lot longer to see if there's some benefit. Because we can see we're not very disciplined. We, are, we have got this laziness. We do put things off. We really feel we can't achieve it. So we've got to be very, very clear in our minds, very analytical, very logical. And one of the main obstacles here, of course, again, another factor of attachment, is this: it, it, what it actually is in our bones, what we're born with from, a, from the habit of attachment in past lives, what we're born with in this life, the, 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 the consequence, the experiential consequence of the habit of attachment in the bare bones level, at the energetic level, is this deep feeling of dissatisfaction. An aching, terrible feeling of dissatisfaction. And we can see in our lives, it can manifest, we can see it with some people, forget yourself, always miserable, always things are wrong, always dissatisfied. That's the suffering of attachment. It's a terrible mental illness. In other words, we're addicted. It's like the, the, half class, the glass half full. That's the attitude. That's the actual function of attachment. No matter what you get, no matter what you do, no matter what you achieve, no matter how much money in the bank, no matter how much practice you do, you keep believing it's never enough. This is a chronic illness. So, of course, all it is, is this attachment, and we bring it into our spiritual practice. So we can be practicing for 20, 30 years and still miserable, still thinking I haven't done anything, still not knowing where I'm going, still really confused, and I can't feel any benefit, I'm still angry, and I'm still depressed. So it's partially true, of course, because samsara is, goes a long way, it'll be a long time before we can be free of this stuff. But as Mami Eshi puts it, we have to consciously practice being content. Having a in other words, having a happy mind mm. instead of negative. We have to practice it. You see, the, 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 tr the catch-22 of attachment, which we buy into 100%, <coughs> is because of the feeling, the energy of dissatisfaction, the feeling. We believe it's true. We believe I am not content. So therefore, naturally, we think, what should I do to get full? So we might go to the food. We'll go to another job, we'll try another boyfriend, we'll try another dress, we'll try another hair colour, we'll try another shape, we'll try another book, another television show. Convinced, oh, that'll do it. Get all excited. Just try that one. Oh, that might work. And then we keep being dissatisfied. Then we'll try another meditation system and another practice. Because having the new boyfriend or having the new Dharma Centre is not what will make you happy. What makes you happy is your mind 
practicing being content. Mm. Truly disciplining your mind to think this is good, I'm doing well. Praising yourself. You, you're practicing music, you're in grade one. It's like being miserable. Oh, I'm only in grade one. Oh, God. <laughs> then you go to grade two. Oh, I'm only in grade two. Then you go to grade three. Oh, I'm only in grade three. That's how we are. So we've got to consciously change that. Consciously change that. And decide, great. I've achieved grade three. You praise yourself. You rejoice. You delight in that. You see how much progress you've made. And you, are, you practice having happy thoughts. It won't come naturally that you'll have happy thoughts. If our addiction, which it is, is to being miserable, is to being dissatisfied, is always finding fault in ourselves. It's just like you keep eating the food, hoping it will satisfy you. I remember watching one of those shows about, you know, extremely fat people. And this poor girl, like 600 pounds, I mean, terribly suffering girl. And her mother, the way she said it, was so kind of just, but it's so profound. She said, she's always been like that. She never felt full. Mm. That's the meaning. It's not the stomach that's not full. Clearly her stomach was very full. Her mind wasn't satisfied. That is the tragedy of attachment. This is kind of hidden to us as we really think about it deeply. You know, in our culture we're called addiction. Oh yeah, it's a serious addiction. Well, Buddha calls it attachment, people. And it's called, the real energy of it is dissatisfaction. That's what gives rise to, oh, I must have that. That comes second. What comes first is a sense of not having enough. Not being enough. Being dissatisfied. It's just the most terrible suffering. It's so unbearable. So we have to consciously change it. But it's just a bunch of thoughts that we've been practicing for eons. We have to consciously tell ourselves, I am doing well. I'm doing my best. I'm doing well. I did this, I did this, and I'm rejoicing in my effort. And then you get more enthusiasm to do more effort. Because you start to get, you know, with enthusiasm, you, you kind of, you feel upbeat. With, oh, I'm not enough, I haven't got enough, you're always downbeat. And that's how you cultivate slowly genuine enthusiasm, a delight in practicing virtue, which is what really the meaning of enthusiasm here, a delight to practice virtue, like a delight in doing delicious things, our objects of attachment normally. But it has to be, again, our minds. Don't wait for it to happen. When I get the cake, then I'll get satisfied. When I get the new practice, then I'll get satisfied. It doesn't work like that. You've got to practice, as long as she says, we've got to practice being satisfied right now. And how you do that? Put the thoughts in the mind. Practice new thoughts. And then eventually they will become familiar with your mind. And your mind will become familiar with those new thoughts. Just like practicing music. Keep doing it, you'll get used to it. Keep having positive thoughts, you'll get used to them. It's like so simple, it's almost embarrassing actually. But this is the trouble. Now, you know, this is the trouble, as Buddha's saying, that whatever the status quo is, we believe that's true. And this is the grasping. This is, this is a lot of emptiness. This is a lot of ignorance. Grasping at the things as they appear to us. So because everything, you know, I can, you, we all know some people, might be ourselves, but think of some people we know, not be critical, but use them as an example, who are really always miserable. I mean, chronically miserable. Not for any overt reason, like pain or anything. But it's like this. It's like a vampire. It's like a. It's like a, a pressure's mind. That's what a pressure's mind is. Terrible dissatisfaction. Aching dissatisfaction. So of course we only notice the problem when a person then goes towards alcohol, and to food, or to heroin, or to sex to fulfil it. But when the person's just sitting in this misery, overwhelmed by depression and and dissatisfaction. That's when it's very nakedly the problem. The second problem is when you're stuffing yourself with a heroin, of course. But the problem is not, you know, of course, see, being such in a pounds is definitely a problem. But the mental problem is the word. This terrible one of no matter what she put in the mouth, she never was satisfied. It's heartbreaking. And this is what Buddha says suffering is. You know, this is attachment. And then, like we were talking before about laziness, 
when we understand the relationship between attachment and aversion, which sounds so boring to us, attachment and anger. You know, as one lama said, a Nima I always remember, he said attachment, he said anger is a response when attachment doesn't get what it wants. Because attachment is the default mode. Attachment is the motor running us from second <coughs> to second. And what it's, first of all, it's a dissatisfaction. And then what it is, is the craving to get what I want every microsecond. I mean, like, desperately. And then when, of course, it gets some level of comfort, which we can sustain, because we've got a lot of merit, we have enough merit that we've got houses and food and friends and partners and a nice, reasonable life, because we've got some merit, how fortunate, we easily can get, you know, sucked into that and then have the laziness of putting it off and then not moving forward, not growing ourselves more, not going to the next level. So what do you think? Any questions? I think we all recognise, don't we? Yeah. No questions? Yeah. Um, sometimes, <coughs> uh, sometimes when uh, I feed my mind like a positive mind state or a, a positive thought, um, I feel some intense negativity, like pain arises from the part of myself that rejects that. Um, I'm lost. Um, so, let's say overall I might be in a depressive mind state, and I'll feed myself that um, I'm worthy, I'm enough, you know, I love myself. You know, part of myself might respond positively, but there might be a physical part in my body, something that I feel that actually hurts. What do you, I don't understand that, what does it mean? I don't get it at all. What do you mean? What do you think it, what do you think it means? What, what do I think it means? Um, I think it's waking me up to a part of myself that might have been numb before. You know? But I, I'm not exactly clear on it, how to work with it beyond that. You know? Okay, okay. Now I feel this pain. You mean, what do you mean by pain? I don't get this pain business. How can your body have pain? What do you mean? What do you mean? I don't understand. It, like... Uh, it would hurt. I don't, I don't know why. But hurt it, where? Your head, your nose, your eyelash, um, your, your toe? Uh, usually like my the right side of my body, my lungs and my um, my throat. Oh gee, I don't understand that at all. Mm. Anyway, just keep persevering very quietly, I think. And just So what do you consider to be what's called rejoicing or a positive mind? What would you call that? Those thoughts? How would those thoughts sound? Do you um, think you should practice? Uh, I love myself. Love yourself, what's that mean? Does that work for you? Yeah. What's it mean, love yourself? Um, kind of like I get this feeling of embracing myself for warm, you know, being warm or kind, um, mm -hmm. and having uh, actual affection for me and all of my mm -hmm. imperfection. Okay, that's good. And praising your effort, praising your, your what you have done, what you have achieved. Mm. Yeah? yeah, praising yourself. Those things too, yeah. Right. That's right. Just practice that, I, that. Yeah, that I'm working. Good, that's good. Yeah. That's good. You know, I think it'll pass. I think yeah. you'll start to get to like the idea that you're doing well. <laughs> yes. Thanks, I do okay. sometimes. Good. Anyone else? Um, Anything to um, Well, yes. I could ask a question. Yeah. Um, I think if I phrase this right, I guess I'm just having glass half empty uh, attitude most of the time and thinking of when we talk about how easy it is to create negative karma, and my mind is running on attachment and, and diversion, so, seems like most of the day. That's what it is. Um, I, I just get this worst kind of laziness thinking uh -huh. I can't possibly make progress. You, know, right. you could die, you know, if I had 20 or 30 years to work on uh -huh. it. Maybe I could get somewhere, but you know, maybe I only have a week or a month sure, or you know, sure. one year. Who knows? Get, we don't know, right? That's right. That's and then I think, well, I'm just going to be shooting off into the, you know, 
depths of the lower realms. <laughs> right. I understand. So I, I don't, I'm, I'm not sure what to do, maybe specifically no, I know. I tell know. myself. The thing, okay, there's so many ways of looking at this, you know. But one of the ways you've been, hearing, you've been hearing me say this lately, and I find it very helpful for my own mind, that we, at the moment, you know, it's okay, now I'll just use ordinary analogy. Anything we're learning that's fairly new, it, it, you see all your foolish mistakes, you can't do that music properly, you're completely hopeless, you can see that, right? But you've got to get some perspective, isn't it? You've got to be, it's re, otherwise it's reasonable that when you learn to do something, you're not very good at it. So humility has to play a role. If there's a lot of arrogance in us, which it turns into self-hate. It's kind of interesting. We understand the particular state of mind called pride or arrogance. We don't tend to think we've got that. But if when you're not doing a good job at something, you end up having low self-esteem, that's, that's the flip side of arrogance. We sort of insulted that we're not as good as we thought we should, you know? So that's one little part of it. What I'm, the bigger picture, what I'm saying is, we have to have the big picture. You realise it is a new thing we're doing. We're learning. And so... Therefore, be humble and patient with yourself that it will just take time. That is just, that's reasonable, isn't it? That's a reasonable thing to say, isn't it? So having a, being, being content with the fact that you're bumbling along, being content with the fact that you're only in grade one, not being upset with yourself, or because that often actually is arrogance. Kind of we're always beating ourselves up, the default mode, you're always beating yourself up, I should be better than this, I should be better than this, it's not enough, it's, not, it's a very deep habit. It's humility, actually. Good enough, Rabina, I'm doing well, well done, girl. But, so it's anger and, anger and pride are together there, very strong. They go very hand in hand, you know. If you're always pushing another person to do a better job, no matter what they do, you keep criticising them. And that's what we do to ourselves. So that's really got to stop. Because that's called anger. And, you know, having anger towards yourself or someone else is still anger. So we've got to have humility. And that's very hard for us. That means a sort of a softness, you know. It's okay. I'm doing my best. I'm doing well. Be having the courage to say that. Now, if you're not doing your best, well, then having the courage, have the courage to recognise that too. So that we have to be able to know when we are doing our best or when we're just beating ourselves up. And beating ourselves up is called anger. And then there's pride coming along there, you know, these things. So, and the other way, so then knowing it's reasonable, having your goal and being glad you're at grade one, because it's better than being grade naught. So you've made some progress. So you've got to have a sense of, um, for me it's like being on a, on a road. You're driving from here to New York. You've only gone 10 miles. So it's like saying, oh, I've only gone 10 miles. I'm completely pathetic. This is ridiculous. I've only gone 10 miles. I should be going 20 miles. Then you're pushing, you're pushing, you're pushing. No matter where you go, when you get to New York, you're exhausted. Because <coughs> you're always not satisfied. Even, But you've got to be, you only are 10 miles. It's a fact. Some people are way ahead of you, nearly in New York now. So that's fine. But that's where pride comes in. If you feel all competitive. That's foolish. Be humble and accept be, and be, great, be amazed and delighted that you've already started the process. So it's just watching our mind and arguing with all those, like the analogy I'm using a lot about all the roommates. Right now, anger, attachment, aversion, low self-esteem, depression, they're all there. All these roommates are there. We've, we've practiced them for a long time, right? And they are running the show. We can say that to some extent. So we, they, they, this, they're going to be a long time before they leave. Until you realise emptiness, they'll still be there, ever subtler, ever subtler, ever subtler. So we, and so part of it, then we've got the good roommates, wisdom and patience, humility. We've got to start exercising them more, and they've got to eventually argue with the other parts of our mind. Because in in the end, it's not I that's doing a good or bad job. Don't sort of personalise it like that. You, you know, your anger is very bad, and your pride is very, but the, the love is quite good, and the humility is getting better. You sort of look at the pieces of yourself and try to praise the good bits and put down the bad bits. Not the whole of you is bad. That's a big mistake. That's based on ignorance, you know? Be more precise about yourself. But knowing there's all these roommates, and that's okay. So then my other point is this, and this is a really major point. Because we have attachment to our comfort zone, that means we want all the ugly roommates to please leave right now. But sweetie pie, it's a while before they'll go, so you'd better start to learn to live with them. And I really sincerely mean this. If you've got a bunch of, literally a bunch of ugly roommates, you, you're angry every day, you wish they'd be quiet, you're always listening out for them, you're criticising them, they freak you out, and you go mad, right? 
So we've got to learn to let, accept that they're there. And it's like living with a pain in your knee. If you're always cursing it and swearing at it, you'll get exhausted. But you just have to accept you've got anger and jealousy. And if you're on the what you're watching every day, you are practicing, the virtues are getting stronger, which is the part of you that's doing the practice. Then you, you be patient with your own anger. You be patient with your own pride. You be patient with your own laziness. But, and the wisdom in you will see it and you'll make a decision to go against it. It's being very reasonable and very precise with our minds, you know. This is what practice is. Be your own therapist. You've got to be realistic. Delusions are liars. Humility, you know, arrogance, anger, they're liars. They exaggerate the badness of me. <clears throat> but be realistic, be truthful, be honest, and be humble. And that will sustain us. Then we'll be content with our small progress and we'll really delight in our effort. And that gives you energy to go to the next step. But if you're always cursing yourself, no matter how far you go, you keep like the glass will always be half full. Right. It's very tricky. That's why we have to see out, listen to all the thoughts. Right now there's this big soup of emotion in there. We can't tell one thought from another. But that's where we get better. You listen to each thought and label each one accurately. That's angry thought, that's a jealous thought, that's depressed thought, that's that's you know, that's that's that arrogant thought, that's proud thought. Because they're all just the thoughts there, we're gonna unpack them, you know. Yeah. With that awareness you mean more skillful. And then when you've got this enthusiasm going one step at a time, then you can look back and you realise you've gone five hundred miles. Wow, I did pretty well. Always have to remember where you've come from, how far you've come, know where you are, and remember how far to go. Then otherwise, you're so caught up in, I'm nowhere, I'm not doing anything, I'm not achieving anything. You've got to have a perspective, a sense of perspective. We've got to be very reasonable with ourselves. And that includes very honest. Don't exaggerate your badness, which is what we love to do. Yeah. Isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I, I, whatever I do, I'll, I'll, I'll think... That's you know, right. I should rejoice in it, but then I also have the feeling of, well, I should have done more. That's right. You know, and, 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 that's that, and that's the voice of dissatisfaction, and that's the voice of anger, both. And we, I mean, and we almost think it's a virtue to criticize ourselves. You know, something I found, a very powerful practice, is to not speak this stuff out. Make a decision that you don't speak it out. Maybe you have a friend you talk to. But just always, if you say, always speaking, don't put yourself down to other people. Don't criticise. Don't. We have this urgency to get it out, like kids, you know. Just don't ever say it. Don't say the anxious things. The, like, we often get very, we got overwhelmed with our lives. Often we're very busy, you know. And we're all, and everybody's stressed out. The first thing we say, oh my God, I'm so busy, I've got so much to do. Cause we, but, but don't say those things. I'm, I, you know, I really think it's very powerful because the words are just expressed, are continuing the thoughts. But if you stop those words and change the script, are you understanding me? No. I mean, I think the one of being busy is so overwhelming for most people. And it's just anxiety about it. It's not hard work that makes us tired, it's the anxiety about it. Oh, I've never oh, I've got enough time, I'm so busy, I've got so many jobs to do, oh, I'm so good, I've got this done, I've got It's just this anxiety pouring out our mouths. Make a decision not to speak it out, for your sake. And only say good things. Like when someone says, how are you? And maybe you've got about 20 different stresses in your life and really some dramas. Say, so I'm really well, thank you. How are you? That, that, that helps us get more courage. Because every time you speak it out, you know, sort of like it, gets, keeps us, it keeps it going. We've always got something. Everybody's got dramas. Everybody's got struggles with family and friends and money and troubles and problems. That's the way life is. I found that very helpful, actually. Do you understand? Yeah. Okay, some people live in denial of their problems. That's not what I'm talking about. Do you understand? Yeah. Someone else? Yeah. So, uh, you mentioned of, uh, when you're on this path, you be content with what you already accomplished. Um, now that you're going to New York, you already drove yeah, you got some, miles. That you are, yeah. if, okay, if you're not, if you're still sitting in, in, in your house and you haven't even begun the journey to New York, don't be satisfied. Right. Because you haven't started. But as soon as you start, you're already doing it. Be delighted. Yeah. So in your spiritual practice, what? 
in your spiritual practice, yeah. right? How do you measure how far you've gone? That's you know awesome. your own capability. It's a it's okay. a relative reality. You know, I mean, how do you measure how good you do with your push-ups? Well, you know that if you've accomplished 20 years, then you're 25 today. You know you've moved forward. You know you couldn't possibly do 30 because you'd break your back. So you know how far you've gone. You know from where you're at. So that's where being honest with ourselves. You know. And if, it's like, when you begin to learn music and you're only in grade one, you don't know enough music yet to really judge how good you are, do you? You've got to ask your teacher, am I doing well? Yes, darling. But eventually, you, you've internalised your music. You've internalised your own, you're beginning to develop your own little music guru in there. You can judge yourself that how well you're doing with your music, because you know the music that well. And it's, it's a referential thing. It's not some absolute, am I doing well in my spiritual practice? It's reference to the past. It's reference to what the, the instructions are. It's not some absolute. So if you've got the instructions well, and you know what you're supposed to do, you'll be able to judge where you're at. And you know, and the real key is if you know you've got the instructions and you're doing them properly and you're keeping your vows and you tick all the boxes, I am doing my vows and I am keeping them properly and I am doing my practice properly, you've got the instructions. If you are doing that as you have committed to do, then you can delight in your progress. Of course you can. You must. And then you see in your life, every time you go against saying angry words and you didn't say the angry word, you rejoice at that. And if you look back, you'll realise that earlier you would be more angry more easily, now you're angry less. That's progress. And we're being honest with ourselves, and we know what the practices are. We get better and better at judging where we're at, because we have to become our own boss. We need teachers, there's no question, to give us, you know, to give advice and to give us some encouragement sometimes. Of course we do. Or even just friends, you know. Thank you. Yeah. Um, it's just a, a really good reminder. I, you know, the penny kind of dropped me in in the joyful effort. Um, just looking at the big path of the, the bodhisattva path of never ever giving up, That's of, it. of persevering. And if I just use those words as a reminder, right. I can take myself back and say, okay, where am I not? Uh -huh. Like I don't want to give up. But then I can go back to the map and sort of say, okay, joyful effort, that's or, right. you know, yeah. the bits there. So it's just a, a really lovely reminder, that's all. No, I understand. For the bigger picture. That's right, exactly. And that, yeah, and that's where, this one of, you know, these, the one of, as is only this said, bodhisattvas think in terms of eons. And that's very hard, because if, look what happens when we read about, so, you know, like we just read about the latest series of dreadful nightmares in Connecticut, you know. The usual response, the first response is either anger, which the politicians should do this and this and this, or overwhelmed, and the biggest one is, oh my God, why is this happening? And we can't bear it. It's just too much pain sometimes. And that's where we have to use that experience to energize our body teacher, which is very theoretical right now. So we go, look at that suffering, it's unbearable, and all the response that we have. But then we've got to pick ourselves up, we've got to say, what can I do to help? And then we probably have to say, not much except I will continue to do what I can in front of me right now. And then the, the biggest one is, and, and I, you use this to energize you to say, and the only choice I've got is to keep moving on my path, no matter how long it takes, to become a Bodhisattva, to become a Buddha, because then I'll be able to benefit others. And that's what gives courage. That's what gives enthusiasm. Because there's nothing else to do. There's, we can't do anything else. That's all we can do. And that's pretty incredible. And that's what get, that's what keeps us buoyant. Like I, like I think, you know, because you see, like I think, like I say, you know, it sounds funny. Even if you're drowning, you might as well be enthusiastic. You might as well be, you might as well be optimistic. What's the point of panicking? You'll drag, drag everybody else with you. Even if you're drowning, you might as well be perky and optimistic. Have enthusiasm. Do you understand? So no matter how bad this world gets, and it's pretty horrible. If you can do something about it, please do it. If you can't, don't just go, oh well, what the hell, and turn your back. You just keep practicing. Knowing we're on a path, and it's not just crossing your fingers and hoping for the best, you're on a path, 
and you are moving forward and you're eventually, the way Buddha is saying is we keep moving, we will become a Buddha at some point. And you use that to energise your enthusiasm, which is what Bodhisattvas have bucket loads of. As His Holiness says, they think in terms of eons. Because there's no choice. Well, which I'm learning is so, so crucial, yeah. as you probably already said a million times, like in this world, you can be surrounded by people or events who will tell you contrary or feed information that's contrary to, you know, oh, I can't be bothered, etc. And it's like, you got to, I have to remind myself, no, just don't give up. That's you know, right. Just go back and, Let's just you know, keep you slip, going. slip that's just it. go back you up. Pick the... up and just keep moving. Yeah. That's exactly right. Yeah. And that actually is the, act, is the action of practicing enthusiasm. Just ne the never giving up. The never giving up. The never giving up. That's what brings results. I always remember just one nice example. I've told this story before. One of the very first people who started to write to us when I was doing the prison project it was in 1997, 96. His name is Paul. He's actually out of prison now, which I'm very happy about. But he had... Um, he was an alcoholic, he was an old drunk, and he killed people in a car accident, you know, had a car accident, drunk, drunk driving. And I, I mean, whatever, the, short, the, the shorter part of the story, he was overwhelmed with grief at this terrible thing he'd done, and he, then he vowed he would only ever benefit people from now on, so he started a Buddhist practice in prison. And um, he really developed a liking for the practice of Tara. He read books and he put, so put himself, he constructed a really nice little practice of Tara, which included refuge, body teacher, the four immeasurables, a really nice little authentic practice. I was very impressed. And he told me, because where he lived in this particular prison, this Folsom prison in California, where you know there's huge, a vast number of people, like in this area where there's like 800 people. And you know, when you see in movies, the prisons with the old bars and the tears, it's just like that. And the noise, something you don't know, think of. But the noise in prison is just beyond imagination. As he said, a couple of, one, of the, one friend said it's like being in a rock concert all day. Or like bedlam, because the noise isn't pleasant, it's aggressive and violent noise, human noise, you know. So he said, a lot of our prisoners said this, the only time he had any peace and quiet was two or three hour, four hour window in the middle of the night. So he would get up really early and he'd do his hour of practice. And he said it was very nice. He really did it very nicely and visualised Tara. It was very sweet, he said, a very sweet practice. He enjoyed it very much. And then, of course, he'd do his practice in the, end, at the, during, in the evening as well. He said that was another story, Ravina, with 800 other people wide awake and wound up. You know? and he'd do his proper... But he would do his practice every night. Now, can you imagine being in a football field or in a rock concert, which is where you live, and you have no choice to do your practice? Already talk about enthusiasm. Talk about, you know, joyful effort. He couldn't put it off. He couldn't say, oh, gentlemen, be quiet. I'm trying to meditate. I'm sorry. <laughs> No, this is not possible. That was his life. So in spite of that incredible obstacle, and that's the point about what enthusiasm is, is going against the obstacle. Because we don't, attachment doesn't like obstacles. That's why we go, oh, I'll do it later. It's too busy. I can't do it now. Too much noise. You know, that's what laziness does. That's what attachment to comfort says. But he didn't have a choice, so he would do his practice every night. And then he said, one Friday night... Right. Um, he said Friday night, maybe even in prisons, Friday night's more berserk. He said it was the noise was so intense and he was doing his practice and he said it was just become too much. Because he tried to do his visualisation and everything of Tara, you know. He said it was just too much, so I, 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 I was about to give up. And then he said all of a sudden all the noise went away. So what happened was, we could say, he, he accessed his subtler mind, which is where there's no sensory experience. It's like, he would have looked like he was asleep. But this is when you've got single point of concentration, you go to that subtler level where it's, the senses aren't functioning, therefore there's no sound, there's no awareness of sound. But he, he just went there. And he said he had this complete vision of Tara and the entire merit field. He said, as real as you and me, Ravina. And he said, and I forget the word, something like this, ecstasy in every atom of his being. And it lasted a long, long time. So first of all, when you're at a subtler level in your mind, which is usually the great meditators who go there at will, he said, I've never had it since, but somehow he just got there. It, that's when, because the grosser level of your mind is not working, the mind is naturally blissful, just naturally. There is, as he said, ecstasy. I forget, I think it was the word he used. 
And, but he, he, in other words, because he had he accessed his subtle level of mind, he was able to see the Buddha in the, what they call the Sambhogakaya, the light body of the Buddha. And I talked about this over there. He said, yeah, the blessings of the Buddhas, he said. So he said, he said, this lasted a long time. And then when I came out of my meditation, and this is my point here, and he had in capital letters, he told me in a letter, he said, what I learned from this was never give up. That's enthusiasm. And the point is, like those, I mean, speaking worldly, those young guys with their IPO, they never gave up. And that's what finally brings the result. We all know that. When you don't give up, when the obstacles come and you panic and you stop, which is when as soon as you meet what you don't like, that's what causes the second one. I'll do it later. I can't be bothered. It's too much effort. And then the one of, oh my God, I can't achieve this. But he just did his practice every single night with immense effort. And then this great blessing and this marvellous experience he had. Just to show his potential, that's all, you know, really. Yeah. So, as I said, I, what I learned from that was never give up. And that's what enthusiasm is. And we know that's what brings results. We know that's what brings results. When you make effort. Because the interesting thing is, we know, even if it's just the chocolate cake and you're hungry for the cake and you're attached to cake and all the little kind of, the, the, the attachments working over time to try and give you a logical reason why you should have another piece when you've already made a decision you didn't want to have another, when you're trying to control yourself, right? So immediately, this is where the laziness is, the attachment's hungry to have the cake and you're finding all these reasons. Oh, I'll go on a diet tomorrow. But the moment you go against the attachment and the moment you exercise your will, if you like, which is to go against the attachment, that's the very second you make effort and that's where contentment comes from. Because you just, it's like you're tasting your own potential rather than the cake. You see what I'm saying? When you can persevere with the gym, you go again tomorrow and again the next day. We all know how good we feel about ourselves that we went against the laziness. We went into the pain and we did that thing. We, went, we, kept, we stuck to our word. We kept to the diet. We did our practice in spite of the problems. We all know that's when we feel good. That's when we can rejoice. We know the agony and the suffering and the self-hate we have. We are lazy. We do put things off and we don't do that thing. We know it's, just, it's like this burden we're carrying around. So making effort, we can see, we can hear psychologically how it's true, how it is the key to success. Nothing changes until we make effort. And as long as Dr. says, you don't really create much virtuous karma until you make effort. It makes sense. It's just logical. You know? It's not moralistic. Psychologically, very sound. So be brave. One step at a time. It can be incremental. You don't have to become Buddha overnight. You can't. <laughs> okay, we might all get little, little kind of like nice experiences like Paul did to give us some courage to know what we're capable of. But just one step at a time. I think that's really the soundest advice. Go one step at a time. Do it what you said you would do. Do your commitment. Keep your vows. Do your practice. A little bit every day, but stretch yourself a little bit every day. Yeah. Sorry, just had another thought. Not only just with that, to keep myself inspired, I guess, just to never give up, you were probably at some point or in some way affecting other people and giving them hope as well to never give up in, in, in persevering. Of course. You, you know what I'm saying? It, it, so course. it's reciprocal. Like I can see that happen. Like, oh, exactly. I'm having an effect on that's right. so and so. I may not know them or I may yes. know them, but that's right. it just well, we, and builds yeah. the energy stronger and stronger Absolutely. for me. So. No, it's right. true. And we all know ourselves. If, you know, if there's, um, you know, among a group of people, if one person is optimistic, they'll need the rest. Because mm. yeah. we all want a person. We all want to be like that. And if we have a person like that, we'll hold on to them and go, yeah, all right, we can do it. It's true. It's very true. It's very true. Yes. I have a question. Um, I'm thinking in terms of the music analogy you used. Yes. And I'm very lazy. I don't uh -huh. have a practice yet. Thinking about starting one. Uh -huh. I get waves of feeling that's good. But with music, for example, I learned guitar. Sure. Never learned how to read music. Uh -huh. I just play for myself. Sure. And when I feel like it, I don't care what anyone thinks about uh -huh. it. So if I, I'm afraid I might take that um, tact with Buddhism. What am I likely to 
What's going on? Okay, well, let's analyse what it means by practising. What do you think it means, practice? What are you thinking that means? You said you haven't got a practice yet. Well, when I take some some vows, keeping them, uh -huh. um, meditating on a regular basis, uh -huh. um, controlling anger. Right. Perhaps. But you do a bit of that now, don't you? Don't yeah. you think you're yeah. working on your mind? Definitely. Wouldn't you think you've got some kind of practice? You've made sort of a commitment to be a better man and be kinder and be wiser and go yeah. against your laziness and angry, against your yeah, anger. So um, you feel you are doing that? Yeah. Well, I'm not trying to make you feel better necessarily, but is it, don't you think it's realistic to say that's a practice <laughs> still? That is a practice. And coming here... The fact that you're even coming here, that you think yeah. it's part of practice? Yeah. So what are you afraid of? Um, being too lazy. That's okay. And like like, I like playing guitar without learning how no, to play No, I understand, music. I understand, I understand. It's just for how it sounds. I understand. But then there's another approach to that. I know what you're saying, and it can be true, but there's also the other attitude in relation to your music, you've still did something, you've achieved something with it. Maybe you can see your mind, maybe you have got a laziness that feels you can't do it. So you stop a bit. It could be that part. And we've all got that very deeply, no? Well, like with guitar, I, I yeah. pick it up when I have a nice song on, I feel sure. like playing. Sure. I have it there, I pick it up. It's blues music, you know, just crying with my hands. Sure. You know? So do you, so what, what, what you are saying is, is probably could be true, we all like this. There's something in you that holds back from pushing too hard. I don't That's feel the any reason to push. It's why. Pardon? I don't feel any reason. Well, if that's the case, why are you afraid of it? If you don't see it as a bad thing, why are you afraid of that happening? But you indicated that it wasn't a good thing. Um, you said that yourself. I see laziness and sloppiness right. and slipping up as I a understand. bad thing. That's okay. So then you're at least you're aware of it, aren't you? Yep. And you know it's a tendency, so? One step at a time. I know what you mean. Yeah. Yes. <clears throat> uh -huh. um, numerous times uh, in my life I've been in such great pain, especially physical pain yes. at times besides mental, yes. that I couldn't bring to bear the energy or the thoughts uh -huh. Um, to practice or transform that pain. Yeah. Uh, for example, most recently I received chemotherapy for right. cancer right. and I was just withering away in pain sure. and uh, I couldn't do anything sure. and I couldn't practice sure. or like, what, what would you uh, comment or advise in a situation like that? Was, was your mind in any way, what was your mind doing? Was it resisting it or were you thinking? Uh, there, was, you, there was no else? resistance. It was just over, totally overwhelmed and yeah. totally exhausting. physical and exhausted. I, understand. I didn't have the energy even to lay on my back. No, I understand. You weren't angry? No, no. Okay. Well, I mean, certainly the Buddhist explanation, as you surely know, would be that every single moment of suffering we have is necessarily the fruit of some past negative karma, so therefore the having of it is the finishing of it. The having of it is the purifying of it. Yes, and I, I, I and recognize you, that, you, all that, certainly. certainly. But so, at the yeah. time, mm. um, I couldn't I couldn't do my practice, and, uh, uh, mm. and, and I couldn't take care of myself nor anybody sure. else. Sure. But that, I mean, uh, that's, that's, <clears throat> that's, what can you do? I mean, you didn't do anything wrong. Right. My God, what right. could you do? I, you know, it's, it, it, I think it's a pretty advanced person mm -hmm. who can go beyond the experience of the body mm -hmm. and learn to do. You know, that's just impossible. I mean, that's you did what was reasonable, seems to me. Right. Well, I had to, I had to stop chemotherapy, which was a big decision because really? yeah, you know, and uh, and uh, I didn't seek the advice of Alama at that you time, did. and mm -hmm. um, and uh, and uh, and did. Did, uh, some practice. You did. And, How is the cancer? Well, it's it's as expected to, in, to be in remission, but I still have a 20% uh, uh, chance it comes back, and I if see. it comes back, yeah. it's I only have months to live. I see. Yeah. It was very aggressive. Uh, and there's no advantage in doing more, is what you're saying, chemotherapy? Uh, no, no. At this time, uh, uh -huh. it's it's in remission, right. and uh, um, so. So you're dealing with it very well mentally, are you? Uh, it, it's very difficult, um, and uh, 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 I 
deal with it uh, by practice, meditation, right. Right. Uh, and also uh, physical exercise, uh, right. and try to stay socially involved. Good. And you're doing everything you can to take care of your body? Yes, yes, and that's what brought me back to the series sure. to go to a top-rated cancer center. Okay, and you're close to some lamas. Pardon me. You're close to some lamas. Um, yes, uh, fortunately, I, I uh, found a resident lama over in Arlington here at Good. the Grand King Kai, who uh, I'm not Good. especially close to, him, but I turned him in for advice. Good, and you feel that's giving you some support? Uh, it. it uh, just the encouragement helped me right. at that point exactly. to make that decision. It was very tough because I could have been signing my death warrant because no, I, uh, I had very aggressive uh, mm -hmm. cancer. I only had a 35% chance of living three, yeah. three more years. Are you having prayers and pujas done by monasteries and things to help you or not? Uh, no, but I, I do yeah. try to you know get to medicine pujas and medicine Buddha pujas. And you don't think it's more helpful to make some offers to some monasteries to have the lovers and monks Oh, I, I make offerings to the uh, people that are begging on the street sides every day. I don't, but uh, you, you don't think it's beneficial to make, I'm just asking, yeah. to have all the monks and the lamas, I mean, uh, to yeah, do I haven't, prayers I haven't, and practices yeah, for I you. haven't considered that, but I, no. but I give, uh, I give donations to the temples here and, sure. and to the, the people begging in the streets. It might be good to, I mean, that's marvelous, but it could yeah. be good extra too. I know Copan Monastery, I know they have a connection with that, but every, yeah. they've got a monk who works full time mm. dealing all over the world with people's requests for pujas and uh, requests for pujas and organizing pujas and things. Okay. And that's something that, I don't know, I mean, yeah, I'm sure. No, as I there say, you know, I, I can use all the help there I There you go, that's right. Exactly, exactly. Uh, besides that, I'm I'm destitute and homeless at the same time because of medical problems. So what uh, do you mean homeless? Uh, I uh, uh, I literally uh, don't have any money or a home. I uh -huh. was fortunate that an old friend uh -huh. uh, allowed me to stay in his home to okay. get the cancer treatment. So, okay. Um, and uh, you know, and, uh, and and because of these medical problems, yeah. uh, my credit rating's ruined. It's impossible to rent. Right. You know, I uh, I was uh, sleeping in a tent uh, in the woods for right. over uh, six months. Right. And uh, though I'm, I'm I'm a mountaineer and climber, so that wasn't wow. As so tough right now you've got a place to stay. Uh, for now, yes. But yeah. uh, the the fellow I'm trying to that right. I'm staying with has turned into an angry drunk. Okay. And uh, so and I've been trying to reach out to him to help him, but uh, as best I can. And fortunately, uh, I have my girlfriend now uh, right here. She's here today, uh, uh, living with me and, uh, and and getting some support well, for that's her. Good. That good. So your mirror hasn't run out yet. Yeah, <laughs> not yet. Okay. Right. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you. Somebody else we know. What do you think? Something more? What do you want to talk about? You have to ask me, come on. We've got half an hour, theoretically. We could stop now. We don't have to have another half an hour. Enough food for thought today? Huh? I've got to have your feedback, I'm sorry. I need you to answer me. <laughs> Mine is blank, but every, everything you've said has uh, been ringing very true for me. Good. Well, good. Um, I guess one little point. Oh, uh -huh. I, I wondered if you were on the third level of um, laziness. Can't be too much. I can't do it. Laziness. Can't, no, I can't do it. You can't do, do you, I, the word that came to my mind was despair. That's right, it would be. Is it very much. I think it's true. That, and that's right, not possible. Not possible. Can't do it. Too much. That's the thing. And that's certainly with your example. You know, when you feels like he's homeless and no money and you've got cancer, you can be dead any minute. You'd think that sounds a pretty good recipe for thinking, oh, well, what the hell, give up. <laughs> but the thing is, is, you know, because the fact is we're all going to die. And you could die tomorrow under a car. You know that. We all know that. And that's the thing I'm saying. Even if you're drowning, you might as well keep having enthusiasm. Because it seems to me, no matter how bad our karma is, how bad things happen, to, be, to keep being not sort of like stupid enthusiastic, but genuinely positive, optimistic, is the only way, because then with a depressed mind, you can't see any options. At least with an optimistic mind, you might see an option if it comes. And then if you're going to, we're going to, whether we suffer or not suffer, whether we're drowning or homeless or rich or poor, we might as well have a happy mind, isn't it? No matter what happens, isn't it? Don't you think? Yeah. Well, the way I came to Buddhism was uh, I was in chronic pain. I had lost everything, my marriage, my home, uh, 
due to illness, uh, from working too hard, actually not giving out. Um, well, that's the wrong kind of giving. Yes, that's the yeah, wrong kind. Yeah, of, yeah. it's like and, the, that's pushing in a right, logic way. Right, and um, and so uh, the only thing is. Uh, that uh, I found that Buddhist meditation practice brought down my chronic pain and well, was a very tangible benefit. Okay. And that is what has propelled me deeper into Buddhism okay. and, the, and what has kept me going to all this. Well done. Yeah. I mean, this is honest, the most hard one, the one that I can do it no matter what. And then, yeah, makes sense. And that's true, what you said. I think we should finish. I think there's enough food for thought. So why don't we just, for two minutes, just close our eyes and just uh, we should have imagined our mind, not physical, but imagine it as vast as space, limitless, clear space. In the nature, just th even just think it, it doesn't matter, just think it. Limitless, vast space and the nature of bliss. Just clear, limitless, blissful consciousness. <coughs> and just get a feeling of just abiding in that space. Just for a minute or two. And then just for another minute, we can um, just sing the mantra of Chen Raising, which is the mantra of compassion, imagining sending out light to the entire universe, to all the suffering, everywhere we turn, all the animals, all the creatures, all the ants, all the fish, all the unbearable suffering of the humans. Sending out light, bringing some peace, some solace, some relief of suffering to sentient beings. And either listen to the mantra, or sing with me. Oh, mani peme hum. Oh, mani peme hum. Oh, mani peme.